What does an $8,000 motion design look like? Hi, I'm Adam Bennett. This is the video shop. In this tutorial, I'll show you from brief to final animation. If you've already watched the previous tutorial in this series, you know what to expect. This will be a case study of an actual paid job I did recently. As well as looking at the final animation, I'll talk in excruciating detail about my creative approach, fixed budget versus day rate, time management, general workflow tips, and one thing I think you should focus on above everything else when working direct to client. My process probably isn't unusual and it's definitely not interesting, but hopefully it's helpful for those of you who want to know how to price yourself or wonder how professional motion designers tackle work like this. I guess we'll also compare the difference between a four and $8,000 animation, at least when I do them. Okay, let's get started. This was the brief. The deadline gave me just over two weeks to get it done. As per the previous video, the target audience was users of the app. And again, Lauren, the client, wanted a UI animation showcasing a new feature. So the main look was pretty much set from the beginning. I could simplify certain screens, but this was never going to have a beautiful ethereal abstract look. It needed to be clearly recognizable as the app. You might be thinking, how can you justify charging $8,000 for animating something so simple? Well, I would agree with you, except for one thing. For the previous video, I charged a day rate of $1,000 a day for four days. This time I worked at a fixed cost, mainly because Lauren showed me a video done by someone else for Cortex, and that had cost 7,000, so there was a precedent for the budget. It was very similar to what I ended up producing in terms of production value. Lauren wanted something similar. I wanted to do something better because I'm a competitive bitch. We agreed on a fixed cost of seven to $8,000, which ended up being, well, you know how much. One of the benefits of a fixed budget is that if you're efficient, it can work out the equivalent of a high day rate. The obvious downside is that if there's lots of amends, you might end up with a lower rate. In this case, I wasn't worried about that. My priority was, well, we'll come back to that at the end but I'd argue it's the most important thing you should focus on when you work direct to client. Here's the storyboard that I came up with. There's a link below if you want to download it. I wouldn't even call it a storyboard really, more like annotated style frames. For God's sake, don't present something like this to a client. I only get away with shit like this because we're friends and she pretty much trusts me. This is a shockingly bad example of how to present a clear, well-designed concept. I'm not a good designer and past projects where I've outsourced the design, they always look better. That's something I'd suggest if you're the same, outsource the design and maybe try to improve your design skills. I am. These frames very much represent a work in progress, a glimpse of what I had in mind. And I pointed out how sketchy the design is in the document. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, but don't send something this slapdash, especially to a new client. Is this some joke? So let's ignore the presentation. I'll talk briefly about what I had in mind. Since the main section of the animation was, I'm not gonna say boring, but the look was pretty much set. I wanted to start and end on strong visuals. A bit like how we approach our showreels. I talked about that in my previous video as well. Hopefully I can come up with an arresting start to grab people's attention. Then make the middle section zip along as nicely as it can, keep the whole thing pacey and slick, and end on a nice visual. And this was the most open part of the brief in terms of creative input, since there were no visuals for this scene. The only other part which had scope to move away from the fixed UI look was scene two, where data is collected from these connected tools and feeds into the results page of scene three. Data's never been represented visually in the field of motion graphics, so I was looking forward to setting a trend. I was confident that my concept would be used as a style bible by all the major motion design studios moving forward. This also seemed a good opportunity to incorporate the text organically into the visuals of the animation and underline the message. So in this case, having the letters connected and then having these characters become the tool icons. Sometimes with these kinds of animations, it can feel as if the on-screen text is competing with other design elements for your attention. I hadn't decided on the overall look yet, so I presented a couple of options for this to Lauren to get her feedback. She liked the idea, although as you'll see later, it didn't quite work out. I talked before about establishing how a client likes to work. With the previous animation, the brief was quite hard to unpack. So there was quite a bit of back and forth, figuring it out, mainly over Zoom. This time the brief was much clearer. The only part I had questions about was this section. What needed to happen in each scene? Again, we did that over Zoom. I said I thought this was a lot of text, so Lauren rewrote the copy and we agreed it was best split over two sections. Don't be afraid to give your opinion on stuff like this. As motion designers, this should be your responsibility, making sure the animation makes sense narratively and you're not overwhelming the viewer with too much information or text. Don't take the script as gospel. You're being paid for your insight. You should have an idea of how long it takes a viewer to read all this text and take in any other action the client wants on screen. In this case, these are icons switching around. If you think that's gonna kill the pace, then say so. Small tweaks to the script might make your life easier and help the final animation flow better. Your ideas are so exciting! This was the first work in progress I sent. 
I won't talk about this part here as I discussed it in detail in my last tutorial. The look of the 3D wasn't quite there yet, but I sent it over as proof of concept. Even though Lauren approved the storyboard and said that she liked this idea, when she saw it, she shot it down. Arguably, this wasn't a great work in progress. While it's a cute bit of kinetic type animation, it does take too long to animate. I should have focused on the transition from the characters to the rectangle box shapes, but you shouldn't make it about you. Sometimes a client just doesn't know until they see it animated. Where's this meant to be anyway? Because they can't get a sense of timing from the storyboard. And actually, that's what animatics are for. So the next version had a transition which went directly into the tool icons. That meant I had to make space in the scenes for the on-screen text. With the previous video, there were headers, but here the text needed to be more integrated, even if show-off kinetic type like this was off the table. So I ended up keeping the animation of the text simple and used text animators. I will wang on about text animators until I'm bound and gagged, and even then that won't stop me. I've already done a few tutorials on them, but for this it was handy as I was constantly tweaking the position and size of the text. By the way, as always, there's links for the full workflows for this animation in the description below, and the free project file is there for you too. A quick tip, and feel free to disagree, I sent a nearly completed export to Lauren, and she later texted me saying she hadn't even watched it. I had to laugh as I read that, but your client might be busy with 10 other things. Don't sit there twiddling your thumbs waiting for feedback. That's lost time no matter whose fault it is. If at all possible, plan it so you've got something you can get on with, so there's always progress being made. With me, I'm always refining stuff at the end, once I've got the main stuff animated. In this case, it was the look of the data and the 3D bookends. So I might send an export to Lauren, but say, are you happy with sections five and six? In the meantime, I'll add detail to scene two, something like that. I'm now telling you how to write an email. Let's move on. One thing I sometimes do to save sitting waiting for renders is to render an image sequence. I then import that image sequence back into the project and use it to render the final file. Why do this? Towards the end of this animation, all the expressions and 3D pre-comps were adding up and it was taking upwards of an hour to render the whole thing. That's an hour every time the client wants to see an update or make a change. Quick note, you might be aghast that I'm exporting a JPEG sequence, which is compressed. Arguably, you should export an uncompressed format such as TIFF or PNG. The compression is barely noticeable, at least to me, and this animation was for online. Lauren even requested a GIF for their LinkedIn. It wasn't being projected on an IMAX screen. Don't use a JPEG sequence for that, obviously. But either way, my point is, rendering out an image sequence will make exports quicker. If the client wanted this text changed here, I'd only need to render out this section and save over those frames. Then close and reopen the project, and an MP4 only takes seconds to export. For what it's worth, here's how I've organized my project. The main section of the animation is this comp here. I've got the rendered JPEG sequences above the actual comps, which I've turned off. These are the bookends. I've got scenes two, five, and six as separate pre-comps. And since scenes three and four contain the same element, it made sense to have that as one comp. Sometimes students ask me how they should plan transitions and when to have things as one shot or cuts. There's no right or wrong answer. It depends on a few things. To transition from scene two to three, I'd always had this in mind, where the data flows from the app tools and converges to become the orange statistic lines of this scene. Long, unbroken shots are nice, but they can be time consuming to pull off. They can also take a long time to amend if the client wants changes. In the end, I decided to make this two separate shots. It still links the two elements thematically and flows, even though arguably having it as one shot would have been more elegant. Other transitions I didn't plan for, such as from the last scene into the end screen with the logo. This is the later work in progress. The cut from this scene to the next was a bit jarring. If you have a camera and 3D layers, it's easy to add a move out of a scene. In this case, the camera is parented to a null, which rotates round over about 10 frames. This matches the movement of the camera move at the start of this scene, so when they're put together, the transition's more fluid. The more I use PureF, the more I love it. Not just for move boards, Near completion, I exported all the keyframes of the animation and laid them out. It's good for checking consistency, especially text sizes. With 3D layers and cameras, it's easy for the text sizes to vary. Also, this means you can do a final check for mistakes. When you're busy animating, it's easy to overlook the text, especially here when it's done in such a simple way. Almost all my time and effort went into two things, animating data and trying to get After Effects to do convincing 3D. But what you focus on isn't necessarily what the audience is interested in. The users of the app know the UI, so this all needs to be correct. And I've designed the animation so the audience has time to read the text. The last thing you want is a typo to slip through. So take the time to export the frames and check them one last time before you think about telling the client you're finished. 
This actually leads perfectly to the clickbait sound in one thing I think you should focus on above everything else when you work direct to client. I think we can often get hyper fixated on doing amazing creative work which will impress our peers or doing some clever clever motion design which will look good on your reel. By all means, if this aligns with what the client wants, go for it. But this means we can take our eye off the ball. This was Lauren's response to the final animation. What might it have said if I hadn't checked my work thoroughly before sending it? I want to keep doing work for Lauren, not just because we're friends, but repeat work for the same client is easier for both of you. For you, you're not having to learn how the client likes to work at the outset. You develop a shorthand. You get to know their tastes, what sort of wild swings their company might go for. For them, they don't feel like they need to keep an eye on you. A lot of chat in our community is focused on attracting new clients. I don't hear quite as much about retaining existing ones. This is another reason I was happy to drop my day rate for Lauren. I'm not interested in money. Or any regular client for that matter. Every time they give you a new job, that's work where you haven't had to spend time hustling to get it. That's a gift, but you have to show that you give a shit to get there. Giving work to the same person is the path of least resistance for a client. They already know and have worked with you. In theory, you should have to royally screw up for them to bother to look elsewhere, but it could be something minor which puts them off. You're slow to respond when they try to contact you, poor attention to detail, whatever. But generally, I've been gobsmacked in the past by how indifferently some freelancers can treat clients, especially when they're eyeing up the next job. They seem to be more focused on getting more work, or new work, or better creative work. They don't seem to realize the importance of repeat business for freelancers or small businesses. Anyway, I've probably got a longer version of this rant, but I'll save it for a future video. The last video took me about 16 hours to animate. This took well over 30. That's purely time I was animating or designing. It doesn't include production time, such as emailing, Zoom calls, and thinking. This would have taken longer if I didn't already have some animated elements from the previous video. And I suppose there was something approaching motion brand guidelines for the main UI sections. Anyway, that was the final animation. And that's it. If you have any questions, obviously feel free to pop them below and I'll do my best to answer them. Huge thanks to Lauren for the work and letting me discuss it here with you. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.